Okay, we're going to start, if you guys don't mind. Thank you very much. Um, so welcome. Welcome to my humble talk. Thank you very much for coming. I'm presuming there are people that are interested in the web here, I, I hope, um, and this question that's plagued me. So if we get into it, or I suppose before we get into it, I'm Mike. I think you'll agree that's a remarkable likeness of me. I'm a Google developer expert in web technologies. I've been one for about two years. I think the fact that they didn't boot me out is probably more surprising than they asked me in the first place. Um, I'm not sure what it means really or why they gave it to me, but I think it's because of the sheer number of hours I've spent apologizing for JavaScript. So, sorry. I work for a company called BBD Software Development in the research and development team there. We do consulting and training of different techs and some research and development that's industry-based. But I don't think I could explain to you succinctly what it is that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. But they still pay my salary, so I think it's working out. I am, shameless plug time, sorry, I am a co-organizer with this lovely lady in front here of Josie JS. Uh, which is the Johannesburg JavaScript community. So if you are interested in web and JavaScript and the larger web ecosystem, um, you should totally come through. It's on the third Thursday of the month or the second last Thursday of the month, and sometimes they're even the same day. Um, and yeah, we've got a really, really cool crowd of people, and we talk about some cool stuff, and it's not just JavaScript. It's everything in the web ecosystem. Um, so to set expectation clearly, I've had a lot of coffee. Um, I run a JavaScript meetup group. I'm here to talk about web at a Linux conference. I don't know why I'm here either. Um, so you're, you all know what you're in for. OK. Great. So why this talk? Well, it's super topical this year particularly, and it's super topical in general, because this year the World Wide Web as an invention is 30 years old, which is an incredible milestone, and it feels weird to imagine a world without it. Um, I personally believe that the World Wide Web is the greatest invention of mankind's history. Like, we can, we've allowed people to learn, um, irrespective of where they're located, contact people that previously they never would have. Um, and I, and I, think, I think this permeates through my love for it. Now, the reason why this particular talk and that particular question is very personal. So as a part of my... Um, uh, GD, GDE interview process. Um, I ended up speaking to somebody who is my dev hero in the last round interview at Google, which is Adi Osmani. Um, and he's super, super cool. And he asked me this question that completely blindsided me. Um, he asked me, if I could change anything about the web, what would it be? And I replied by going, yeah. That's a hard question because we take it for granted, right? It is what it does. We learn how to build for it. We don't think about what it should be, right? So a lot of this talk, and that was about two and a half, three years ago, and it's, it's haunted me ever since. So a lot of this talk is about me trying to come to terms with and unpack what that means. So before we can figure out what the web should do, I think we need to look at what the web does do, right? I think it's a reasonable starting point. And I think it's very, very clear that memes are the single largest purpose for the web. Sharing social commentary, right? Joking. Followed by cute pictures of our pets doing adorable things, right? Followed by social media and mindless ram rambling on the internet. Followed by lots and lots and lots of ads, which is actually important. Like, this is only partly a joke, but Ads keep the internet running. They fund most of the internet. E-commerce, like who's used, who's used an e-commerce site to this week? Right, probably most people. Who's used an e-commerce site today? Well, I've been focusing on my talk, but there are people, right? Um, the web needs to be this marketplace. We rely on it as a core part of our day-to-day -day living experience. News, I'm sure everybody's been on a news site of some way, shape, or form today. Um, the, the World Wide Web has killed traditional news media because we can uh, choose what news we follow that um, matches our proclivities and our interests, and um, we can vet, vet for ourselves news sources that we believe in. We don't just have to believe in Fox or CNN or whatever the case may be, which we probably shouldn't anyway. Um, and knowledge. 
We've, we've literally encoded the sum total of human knowledge and put it freely available on the internet. Some of it more free than others, but I think we can all agree that you can get an exceptional education just by having a simple internet connection. So that's important. I mean, those are some lofty ideals from the human side throughout the knowledge side and throughout this idea of us being the shared entity of humanity. So why should we care? Why should we care about what the internet does? Well, let's unpack it through some, some reasonable celebrities. Now, I don't know if you know David Hanemeyer Hansen, who's um, one of the original creators of Ruby on Rails, right? He's a polarizing figure, like you agree with like 50% of what he says vehemently and disagree violently with the rest. But, but he said this thing earlier this year about how the web is not just another software platform, it's the greatest software platform. Um, it is the thing that there are no rules to enter that everybody can compete on. And it's our responsibility to look after this great software platform and keep it going forward. Which resonated with me very, very heavily. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play you this, right? Just to go back in time, um, and we're going to start going further back in time, um, to about 98 with David Bowie. No, you see, I don't, I don't, I don't agree. End. I don't agree. I think the internet. I don't think we've even seen the tip of the iceberg. I think the potential of what the internet is going to do to society, both good and bad, is unimaginable. I think we're actually on the cusp of something exhilarating and terrifying. It's just a tool, though, isn't it? No, it's not. No. Now it's an alien life form. What do you think, I mean, when you think then about... The Is there life on Mars? <laughs> yes, it's just landed here. But yeah. that's, it's a simply a different delivery system there. You're arguing about something more profound. Oh, yeah, I'm talking about the, the, the actual context and the state of content is going to be so different to anything that we can really envisage at the moment. Where the interplay between the user and the provider will be so... In simpatico, it's going to it's going to crush our ideas of what m mediums are all about. Right. So, I'm not saying that David Bowie was holding the fabric of the universe together, but some days it feels like we're definitely on the darker timeline. Um, this was '98, right? So, what 20 years ago? 20 20 years ago, um, the internet, World Wide Web, was still in its um, in its infancy. You know, this was pre-dot-com boom, and this guy saw what it was all about. So saw how innovative this was. But if we dig even further backwards, like we get obsessed with this idea of innovation and change and this constant turmoil of latest JavaScript framework, latest tool, latest, latest piece of tech and widget that we can talk about. That's not innovation. That's not vision. This is vision. It is The Mother of All Demos by Douglas Engelbart in December, 9th of December 1968 at an American computer manuf manufacturer's slash IEEE um, meeting where he uh, presented this working prototype that has subsequently been dubbed The Mother of All Demos, right? He showed for the first time Windows, um, hypertext, graphics, navigation and command input, video conferencing, the first working mouse prototype that he eventually patented, um, and then the patent expired and Apple, Apple stole the idea. Uh, word processing, file linking, and real-time collaborative editing. I mean, that's a long time ago, and like that was innovation, and that was basically how we work today. So I think, I think it's important to understand one's history and like get some perspective as what real change looks like, what real innovation is. But then, you know, more relevant to this particular discussion, that's still live. That is the first page on the World Wide Web. You can go and visit it. Well, this isn't it in its original format in 1989. This is a slice in time that they've kept from 1992 because they didn't think they needed to back this stuff up before 92, before they realized, oh, wait, we should probably be recording this. But yeah, you can still go visit it, which is a, a blast in the past, and everything still works. Um, and then even more so, I'm sure a lot of you recognize this gentleman, Tim Berners-Lee, who's the inventor of the World Wide Web. Now, I think at this point in time, like it's, it's interesting to talk about why is this an invention, and people conflate the idea of internet and World Wide Web. 
Well, internet preceded it, right? It was just the network of networks. TCP IP had already been created and standardized. This was literally created for a single reason, that Tim got tired at CERN of having to SSH into some remote computer to download documents and then SSH, SSH to another computer and upload documents. It was super tedious and it was this um, closed view of sharing information and learning. And he was like, wait, well, why wouldn't it be awesome if we could just share the documents directly with everybody, um, building on this idea of hyperlinking and hypertextual media? Which is amazing. So when like, we talk about the World Wide Web as an invention, what it was is was a combination of three things. HTML as a markup language, uh, hypertext as a concept of linking documents, and then a browser which was called World Wide Web. Um, as a, a, a super cool thing for this year's anniversary, they uh, re resurrected the original World Wide Web browser off of the NXT computer that was running at CERN, and they moved it to the web using WebAssembly. So if you go to the, the W3C page, you can go and actually use the original browser. It was awful, really awful. But it's, it's cool, man. It's cool from a blast from the past. Um, but so, so the idea is that even this wasn't... wasn't it was a major invention, but it wasn't the revolution. The thinking behind this was largely based off of a gentleman by the name of Vannevar Bush. I don't know if anybody knows that name. Great, awesome. So Vannevar Bush was a, a renowned scientist and engineer in the States in the 30s and 40s that changed their view on how they saw science. And his big idea was they had a lot of microfilm at that stage. And he thought it would be amazing to have this thing that linked microfilm documents together, being able to navigate across this whole mesh of data and share knowledge, which was super impractical at that point in time. But I think that, that idea called the Memex at that point in time brought its way forward to what we see as the World Wide Web today. Okay, and then about five, five or six years after that, um, Tim Berners-Lee realized what he had in about 95 and said, well, this is a, this is a bigger thing. This belongs to humanity. Um, so he founded the World Wide Web Consortium to look after it and standardize it and make sure that this resource was available for everyone in humanity and served all of us. And if we take a look at what the W3C stands for, the, their ambitions, their mission statement, is that the web needs to be accessible for all. It needs to be able to run on everything, which is a reality that we see today. It can almost run on everything. Um, it needs to have rich interactions. And this is, this is the view today, because it is evolving. But it needs to have rich interactions. Um, it has to link data, not just link documents, not just link experiences. And it needs to be trustworthy which I think is one of the parts where we're failing the web at the moment, right? Now, we've gone through the little history lesson, and I thank you very much for, for keeping up with me and not getting up and walking out. Uh, I think it's important to know where we come from so that we know where we're headed. And if we know where we're headed, we can understand why we're headed in that direction. So if you look at where the web is headed, um, we then can also take a look at the W3C website and figure out, well, these are the things that they care about. These are the aspects of the web that they want to focus on. Commerce, entertainment, telecommunication, payments, things, and then accessibility, internationalization, security, and data. So there is this dichotomy present that it is firstly serving humanity, serving people in all their guises and forms, and then secondly, creating an ecosystem where in which we can work. For this to serve humanity, it needs to be a, a functioning marketplace, right? We need to use it to do business in a trusted way. And for the new features, I think it's important to understand that. So when we look at, and I'm just going to do a, a quick tour of the, the bits and pieces of the web that's being standardized at the moment, right? This is literally the stuff that we're coming up with. The first one is this idea of a payment request API, um, having a unified format so that users can trust when they hit a page that they can pay using a reliable mechanism that the browser controls, not some weird pop-up that you don't actually know whether they're saving your credit card details or not. Um, and this is implemented in some bits and pieces already, um, and it's probably going to change a bit going forward, but it's, it's pretty robust. You can use it now. Then, on the more human side, they're wanting to implement a share API. Now, this is predominantly to start competing with mobile, right? Because people have moved away from the, this, this open shared platform that is the web to smaller proprietary platforms. Um, 
and yes, Android is still a proprietary platform with its own gatekeepers, right? Um, you can do what they allow you to do on it. And a big part of that is to try and take some of the functionality and then bake it into this open experience and let everyone have access to it. So Web Share API is that, or the start of that. Then we've got this idea of WebAssembly. Now JavaScript is great. I love JavaScript. But it's not great at everything. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that we would like to have run in the web, but there's no way we can rewrite it into JavaScript because JavaScript's just not going to cut the mustard there. Um, so WebAssembly gives you really, really low level platform code that you can run in a browser in a secure sandbox um, and then bring older code bases forward or build brand new functionality in sophisticated new languages like Rust. Um, and there are others that compile to WebAssembly, but we're not going to go into too many specifics. Um, and it's, it's useful, right? And I think it, it gives older applications that are tied onto platform hardware, here's looking at you, VB6 and Complus, um, and move it to the web. I think the, the biggest uh, success case for this was Adobe AutoCAD, where they always wanted to have like a web pro uh, um, property, but they could never take their 35-year-old code base and move it to JavaScript. It was just not going to work for their core rendering. But with WebAssembly, they could compile code that was literally older than the web and run it on the web. I think that was cool. Then there's Jerry's favorite, right, which is the Web USB API. We demand more than just documents from our web pages, right? We needed to do stuff. We needed to interact with things. Why do we need proprietary operating systems or open operating systems? Why do we need differences when USB should just work the same everywhere, right? That's the point of standards. And web USB is a way of saying, well, let's standardize that to the point that the browser can speak to common USB devices um, as it chooses. Web authentication, like the web is not trusted. It's the wild west, right? We don't do good authentication. Um, username and password as a, as a standard, even over SSL, is a really, really low bar that we fail all of the time. And the Web Authentication API is, that, is effectively saying, let's use asymmetric cryptography. Let's teach people how to use their biometrics safely, keep their biometric fingerprint on their lo own local machine, generate a public-private key pair, and then share that rather than a plain text string. That could make sense, right? Teach people how to use the web in a more safe way. Um, so I'm really excited about this. You can do this today. On iOS, predictably, there's some um, weird issues with it, but on other platforms it works really, really well. And I'm hoping that people start adopting that going forward instead of username and password. And then some more esoteric stuff that's further out there, right? People want immersive experiences and they want those immersive experiences to go to the web. AR and VR are things that people would like to have happen. Um, and this API is growing but people are not sure, like, we've got access to the hardware, but what kinds of functionality do we want? So it's still a very proprietary space at the moment. Importantly, a hyper area of focus at the moment is the Writable Files API, because the browser has always had this fear of writing to user-privileged space, correctly, justifiably, because um, that's how malicious software gets spread. That's how you can't sandbox what it can access. Um, and unfortunately, it's one of the big things that mobile has always had over the web. It's one of the big use cases that people have. Yes, but I can access my local drive. So from a security perspective, there's no real difference between those use cases. We just need to treat the browser like it is a native application, right? So um, something that they're working on, and they're very, very, very hyper aware of security and privacy, is this idea of being able to write in a sandbox controlled manner to your local storage. And that'll open up a whole new bunch of use cases for us for building on the web. Badging API, perhaps a little bit esoteric, but it's something that people want to replace mobile experiences, be able to show badges when you've built a progressive web app, for example, sick. Um, just again, to compete with native. Contact Picker API, this is again a privacy concern. You don't want every website that you access potentially able to strip contacts off of the device that it's accessing from. So they're very, very careful behind how we do this, but um, it is something that we need to be able to compete with mobile. Shape Detection API is really cool, starting to do something different, giving you the ability to, uh, using browser primitives, uh, identify different types of barcodes 
which is awesome. Facial recognition, shape recognition, image recognition. Um, and I think that this just shows the way that we see apps evolving over the, the coming years. Wake Lock API, and this is again a, a native feature that we, we expect on devices, um, being able to communicate to the user when something's running in the background, saying, hey, cool, do this thing, or here's a thing. Um, and this is one of those ways that the web can then um, compete in that space. Now to some more weird and esoteric stuff that I think is really, really important for us. Web portals um, is one of the browser standards that's coming, and it's basically iframe 2.0, if that makes sense. So iframes were a really, really good idea, really bad execution a long time ago, and they've never really recovered. But at its core, it's a good idea. We need a secure way to share content across domains in encapsulated uh, bounded contexts and a secure way to navigate between those in an interactive way. And I think the example that they use is like navigating on stuff via a mobile app like Facebook. Um, so I think there's some exciting stuff coming there and I think it's going to change the way that again people interact with moving across different properties. And then one that's really, really important for us in an African context, even if we don't realize it, is web packaging format. Now this is, this is basically what the AMP project is becoming. So does anybody know of AMP and AMP HTML? Okay. So it's basically a way of packaging up your website, giving it to Google and having them serve it for you in a, in a hyper fast way, hyper lightweight for low bandwidth conditions. But now obviously that comes with um, its own challenges, and anybody who's worked with AMP knows what those challenges are. It's a very confused project, but the core thing that we want out of this is that having that centralized point of contact is always going to disadvantage us in the bottom end of Africa, right? Web packaging is saying, I can take all my content, sign it, have anybody deliver it, and we can even deliver it peer-to-peer -peer using Bluetooth, which is a realistic use case for a lot of our, our new users. Um, and then still verify that this is the content, this is the site that I was expecting. So there's some really, really interesting stuff there in, into just disintermediating the internet from like the global west, if that makes sense. Um, and a lot of this stuff is bundled under this concept in, a Google, in Google terms, and forgive me for saying that, I am a GDE, um, under this project called Fugu. And why it's Fugu? Fugu is the puffer fish. And the reason why is because uh, the puffer fish is apparently very difficult to prepare properly. And like, if you do it properly, it's incredible. It's apparently the most amazing fish you can consume. If you don't do it properly, it'll kill you. So the idea behind this project is that it's super, super important. And if we, as people who are standardizing for the web or who care about the web, being Google, um, do it correct. The web is going to become this most amazing thing, even better than it is at the moment. But if they screw it up, we're all going to die, metaphorically speaking. Now, the last bit I'm going to cover is just, we now know where we came from, why we should care, and where we're headed. How do the features get there? Like, the, it's a long road, and what does that road look like? I don't know if everyone's, anyone's super aware of like standardization processes. Maybe, maybe some. Okay, I see some nodding heads. Cool. So if you thought that all of the standardization for the web was handled by W3C, you would be completely justified in thinking that. You would also be wrong. So in about 2007, 2008, um, the web was moving super, super slowly, and it was moving at a crawl. And those of us that were building at that point in time remember those days, right? Um, that's why jQuery became such a big thing, is because standardization was awful. Um, and XHTML was awful. And like they said, I, th I think the, the quote was from W3C is that at the rate that they were going, it would take them nine years to reach HTML5. So like we would still not have an HTML5 now, I don't think, or we would just have gotten it, which is insane because like it's an old school buzzword from a web sense at the moment. So a whole bunch of the browser manufacturers, Firefox, WebKit, predominance amongst them, and then eventually WebKit becoming Blink, um, they decided that this was an awful idea. And they worked, they created this um, web hypertext uh, blah, 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 blah working group. I don't even know what it stands for, which is the living specification of HTML. 
and they all contribute to it separately from the W3C, and they're the ones, that's the standard that's actually followed as a living document for what browsers actually rendered. So if you're confused and you're thinking, but like, how, how, can, how can that be the way that it works? Again, you're justifiable in thinking that, right? It's, it's awful, it's insane. Like, we've got the standardization body, but like the browsers have this collusion behind the standardization body, and they actually decide themselves what, what it is that they want to support. And it's because the web is important and we need to keep it moving forward and we can't be bogged down in details. As it turns out, the W3C has twice attempted to fork uh, what working groups standard and create, like bring them back into the W3C and both times it's failed. Um, recently, they've come to a new agreement to, to work together on standardizing HTML and browser APIs. Well, this is, this is specifically HTML in fairness. Um, but you'll, you'll find that like different APIs sit within different spaces. Some are inside the what working group and some are inside W3C. Super confusing to try and unpack. But broadly, this is how it works in a W3C context, right? You've got the idea of this incubation group, which is key industry leaders that are W3C members, which you have to pay for. Um, that meet together and they brainshop workshop ideas and they brainstorm these ideas that could become, you know, how it could work. Um, and then separately, they might have key workshops inviting people from industry, like experts or whatever the case may be. And then they create this working draft document. Um, and the working draft document then goes to the, um, I think it's, I think it's the chairman's review, and then the chairman's review then goes to the president's review, and then that that then gets, becomes REC, which is the standard. That's a recommendation implementation of the thing. So what it means is that at every single point of that process, WC3 paid members are involved, um, and you as the global public can only really contribute at two points. You can give input into the incubation group stuff, because they're normally, depending on the group, super open for ideas, and there are forums that you can contribute to and you can chat to about things, and then you can get to like the proposed recommendation, which is far too late to change anything, right? At that point in time, if it gets scrapped there, it's all the way back to working group stages. And there are proposals that have been scrapped at that point in time, but this is part of the reason why it's such a lengthy process. So if you have ideas, putting them in and getting involved at the front end of that process is the best way to go about it, right? Um, and contribute to this stuff, and working groups are pretty open to that. So from a Project Fugu perspective and how Google as, or Chromium, let's call, talk about the Chromium dev team, um, ships this stuff, prioritizes and ships. They internally identify the need that fits with things. They'll do this low ceremony specification called an explainer. And you can always go and look and comment on their explainers. And I know that Microsoft, as of moving to Chromium as well with the Edge browser, do the same. They've also got the same explainer process because it's cheap and easy to do. And you can get a lot of feedback really quickly by a one page. This is how it's supposed to work. Like, this is what the API looks like. This is how we want people to interact with it. Um, they solicit feedback on GitHub. They iterate really quickly until they're happy with the explainer and people can't poke any more holes at it. Um, and then it goes into the formal specification process. Now, this typically, that'll be different points. This will be um, at the incubation group stage of um, the W3C process, or it'll go into the what working group pro process or the CSS working group process, or TC39. Um, but Google doesn't wait for that. The Chromium dev team, and most of the, well, Firefox is different, but the Chromium dev team refuses to wait for the standardization process to repeat before testing something. So they'll put it out behind a flag inside Chromium, um, and then they'll do this thing called an origin trial, which is super, super cool. So you can sign up for an origin trial for your property, your domain property, and you say, cool, when Chrome or Chromium hits this URL, enable the following features inside Chromium. So you can test brand new APIs in the wild with your users, soliciting feedback straight, in, straight into the, the specification process um, at any point in time. So if there's ever anything that excites you, you can definitely trial it and you'll be helping push the web forward. Um, that does come with a certain amount of risk. 
if there are problems with the, the API, if there are problems with the specification, it's footstoots, right? That, that stuff can be rolled back and might not be in the browser in future. Okay, mm, so let's just talk about JavaScript for a moment, right? Because I can't leave the talk without having spoken about JavaScript at least once. Now, um, JavaScript is not a thing, it's a brand, right? It's a brand, that's, it's a trademark that's owned by Oracle. We call it um, JavaScript that we write because of tradition um, rather than anything else. And it basically came from um, this interest that um, Brendan and I had in the, the nascent Java that was developing in the early 90s. He spoke with the architects and so on and so forth. And like everyone would have heard the saying, um, JavaScript was created in 10 days, right? And it shows. And that's primarily it, because they had all of these months and months and months of discussions with the, the Java architects. And then Brendan and I was like, right, I'm going to do nothing, none of that. I'll do something completely different. Um, and like one of the original working titles or working names for the language that would become JavaScript was Mocha. I don't know why they didn't just stick with that. That would have been so much cooler than JavaScript. Anyway, um, but JavaScript isn't, isn't looked after by anyone. What Brendan Eich realized is he realized that there needed to be some sort of standardization committee. So he gave it to the Uni Un European Computer Manufacturers Association saying that I don't have the capacity to standardize this. Um, somebody has to, and here you go, please look after this. And they were like, cool, we'll formulate technical committee 39. And technical committee 39 is going to look after um, ECMA script. So the thing that we actually write is some derivative of ECMA script. And then in the late 90s, the European Computer Manufacturing Association was like, wait, but we can't really be European and ship this thing globally. So they then created this ECMA International, and now the E in ECMA doesn't actually mean anything anyway. So it's just, like, it, it's hilarious. Um, but importantly, the standardization process for JavaScript features, uh, which are not API features, that's what working group. JavaScript features being language stuff is completely different to any of the rest of this. They have their own staged process and they release in annual feature sets. So ES 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. So if you're currently struggling with transpilers, you're going to have to probably struggle with transpilers forevermore. We're really, really sorry about that. Um, but yeah, so just as an aside, I think, I think it's interesting to know because it's such a pivotal part of the ecosystem but not strictly speaking uh, uh, a, a blocker for any of the API things. Now, so to finish off, this question that's plagued me for the last number of years, what should the web do? I don't know, do you have any answers? Okay, and I have 3D printed Chrome dinosaurs if anybody, if anybody wants, I had three. It's somewhere behind the machine now. I can, there it is. So for good questions or for good suggestions about what the web should do, I'm not just throwing that out for nothing. Yes. Sorry. Evolving. It should keep evolving as it has been doing. But so the problem with evolution is that evolution is very reactionary, right? So evolution. Um, I think be becoming proactive is part of evolution. But then being proactive is a case of where should it go, right? So, okay. so let I've me give abstracted you uh, very highly, so okay. apologies for that. No, no, that's cool. Here you go. Here's your dinosaur. But as a, so let, let's talk about specifics, right? There are people, um, I, I, you're next, you're definitely next. Cool. There are people who want to standardize React. React is so popular, let's put it JSX into the browser. Is that reactionary? Is it the right thing to do? And as it turns out, no, it's not the right thing to do. There are very many concrete reasons because React doesn't respect any of the existing, uh, um, well, not any, but many of the re existing browser idioms. Um, it's like it's a challenge, right? So evolution is not always the right thing. Sometimes it needs a guiding hand. We need to look a little bit further forward. Yeah. So my feeling is it should just become the operating system across everything of everything. It, well, I don't think it should, but that's where it's going, it seems to be. Absolutely. Preach, brother. <laughs> there you go. 
and then at the back there. Yes. Agreed. Like, and I think I think that is the. So, so the the statement was that it should serve mankind, and I think like that's that's not that's not an esoteric goal, right? It's not a. Um, it's not just philosophy. It's something that we do every single day. Whenever you write, whenever you turn a div into a button without using a button, you're making a decision to exclude part of humanity who rely on accessibility features. So we need to identify those. And if those accessibility features are not cutting it, it's our responsibility as a part of that ecosystem to tell the people that have control over this stuff that it's not good enough. Okay. Another comment. Sorry, they could, they could kill. <laughs> That's why they went extinct. Okay. Mike, thank you very much. Um, I especially agree with everything you want to do here. Um, not so much a question, but a statement yeah. uh, to assure you that I am currently working with a major bank, South African bank at the moment, to build um, part of an API marketplace that will be uh, specifically facilitating payments, which was the first item on your wish list. Yep. Um, PSD2, I believe, is the UK standard, which is okay. um, we're implementing here in South Africa. Hopefully, there'll be more take up, and you should be extra happy to understand that we're doing it in awesome. Node JavaScript. Good job. Awesome. Sorry, I'm out of dinos dinosaurs. Yes. Can you put the um, gift about JavaScript on again? Okay. <laughs> the GIF about the JavaScript, because my boss missed it and they will enjoy it. I am a river to my people. <laughs> okay, cool. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you very much for being such an awesome audience.